His name is, I believe, Adam. Look, I, I actually empathize with the people of Gaza. You know, they have a term called jihad, which is a holy war. It's a two-part war. Uh, one is the spiritual struggle internally, and one is the external struggle, which literally means killing people on behalf of your uh, your belief. But people yeah. think there's some something that Muslims inherently they hate Jews. Or when the Prophet Muhammad went to Medina, he uplifted Jews and women. How did he do that? Let me quote you, Paul, a Jewish scholar by the name of Dr. David Warrenstein. He wrote, Islam saved the Jewry. Means Islam saved the Jewish people. Right? So the number one reason that he gave is that uh, the Jewish people, they were at the brink of extinction. Who told you that the Arabs were going to kill us? We had great relations with the Muslims and the Arabs back in the day. You know, his family lived in Hebron and his half family lived in Jerusalem, but always had, you know, Jewish minorities. He said, we had great relations. We shared the same values. We shared a similar culture. You know, we all treat each other with respect. It was only, only, only when the Zionists... me, I always had um, uh, hopes in Jordan Peterson, but uh, uh, that he failed. When Palestine is free, people like him are going to be ashamed that they did this. Now I really have hopes in uh, Patrick. Uh, uh, Patrick. David. The, on the contrary, the Muslims and the Arab people were for us our friends and our patrons, the ones who protect us and provide a safe haven. This guy right here, this guy's trying to build a Dawa center in our country. I'm not talking to you right now, you're a solo. You're trying to build a Dawa center here. Islam is violent by nature, my friend. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. This is exactly why we need the Dean Center, because we have over 300 million Americans who know nothing about Islam, like this guy. Hey, you want to have a talk? Yeah, this guy's trying to build a Dawa center in our country. And Surah 9 is the most violent chapter of the Quran. The Dean Center will be a source of light, a mega Dawa center, an educational center, helping our brothers and sisters in humanity truly understand Islam and Muslims. And brothers and sisters, remember the great rewards of just guiding one person in humanity to the truth is better than everything in this dunya. So get in on all the rewards and blessings. Click the link below, donate right now. May God Almighty Allah reward all of you. Assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Welcome to the D Show, I'm Eddie, your host. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, notification bell, so you can get up to date with all of the current shows that come out. My next guest, Sheikh, Fadil Suleiman, his master is in Islamic studies, is an international speaker, orator, filmmaker, and presenter of Islam. He started the Bridges Foundation in 2005 with the aim of connecting people of different backgrounds to help them understand Islam and Muslims. He has made three films about Islam. The series are called The Fog is Lifting, Islam in Brief, and Jihad, get this, Jihad on Terrorism. And which has been translated into 31 languages. Now, something that's very interesting that we're going to be talking about, he's actually been implementing, because recently there's been a lot of talk about the discussion, the debate of the year, and the PBD podcast with Patrick Ben David. So he's been actually implementing Patrick's vision of Muslims and Christians and others working together against what Patrick calls the greater enemy. What he has to share is very interesting to say the least. But first, first, we're going to have him react to something else that was just, I think, yesterday or the day before yesterday, what was broadcast on the PDB, PBD podcast regarding Islam, Muslims, and Jihad. So let's get into this clip and we'll get right into bringing our next guest out when i was ready to talk about it i would only talk to yes and i was explaining how much respect i have for the faith of islam welcome to the dean show the dean show any expert but i've been there a bunch and i know people and i have friends and this is a mm -hmm. this is you know israel is the only democracy in the middle east it's not even close and uh so you ask like who are your allies PBD is coming out with a book called Choose Your Enemies Wisely. Look, I, I actually empathize with the people of Gaza. You know, they have a term called jihad, which is a holy war. It's a two-part war. Uh, one is the spiritual struggle internally, and one is the external struggle, which literally means killing people on behalf of your uh, your belief. But assalamu alaikum. We start with the greeting of peace. Peace be unto you. How are you doing? 
وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Long time no see. Yes, yes. Good to have you on the program again. Yeah. So you got to see this clip now. Oh yeah. Uh, before before we get into Patrick's vision, you got to see the discussion debate of the year, and we were going to do some commentary on that and give some practical. Actually, you going deeper into this uh, with the whole alphabet movement and everything else. <laughs> this came up. This is your specialty. This is what your documentary revolves around. This term jihad. Yeah. Yeah. How would you react to this? This is, I believe, Sam, when I was down there, I actually got to meet Patrick, really nice guy, and we had a good time together. And then, actually, I met Vinny. Vinny is also someone who is part of the podcast, met him, real nice guy. He actually has, uh, he showed me his tattoo. He has, uh, in Arabic, he has, a, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, Alhamdulillah, tattoo. Oh, mashallah. All praise to God. Yeah. Last week alone, 200 uh, Palestinians were killed. I like them. I like them both. I mean, I mean. And uh, this one, I believe, I didn't meet him. His name is, I believe, Adam, and we're going to assume Adam, like most people, they just hear what they've been kind of programmed through through the media and, and much of the uh, hate industry, the Islamophobic industry, so they catch these things, these talking points. How do you address this? How would you react to Adam and yeah. others who got to hear this misinformation? They have a term called jihad, which is a holy war. It's a two-part war. Uh, one is the spiritual struggle internally, and one is the external struggle, which literally means killing people on behalf of your... Uh, your belief, but funny thing is that he he said that jihad means holy war. Actually, holy war is a Christian term first heard in the Crusades. Pope Urban II, who launched the Crusades by calling all Christians in Europe to war against Muslims in order to reclaim the Holy Land, and he cried out, "Deus volt, God wills it." So the word holy war. By the way, in Islam, war is not holy. God acknowledges in the Quran that Muslims hate war. God said in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, which is chapter number two, sign number 216, Combat has been prescribed upon you even though you dislike it. So God actually acknowledges that Muslims dislike war. And then he says, but it may be that you dislike something while it is good for you. And maybe that you like something that is bad for you. For Allah knows and you know not. So God prescribed not holy war, combat, qital, on Muslims. But there is actually um, a combat code, which is a long, yani, it's a long talk about that. But war in Islam is haram, forbidden, except if it is in the form of jihad. What is jihad? To cut it short, jihad is war on terrorism. And that's why we need to know what is terrorism. You know that in 2005, Eddie, 150 monarchs and presidents met in a summit in the United Nations to define terrorism. And after three days, the summit ended without a definition. You know why? Because had Why? they accept the definition of political scientists, at least 50% of them have to go to jail immediately. Wow. Yes, of course. According to political scientists, uh, terrorism is targeting non-combatants to support a political or an economic agenda. Targeting, not killing, because you may... Target people and you don't kill them. Maybe you just injure them. Just targeting them makes it terrorism. And it's non-combatants, not civilians, because some civilians are combatants and they are called militia. Those are actually legal targets. But targeting non-combatants to support a political or an economic agenda. And, and this means that most of the terrorism that is carried out is carried out by states, state terrorism, not actually individuals or groups alone. Look at chapter number four, Surah An-Nisa, uh, sign number 75. It says, وَمَا لَكُمْ لَا تُقَاتِلُونَ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَالْمُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مِنَ الرِّجَالِ وَالنِّسَاءِ وَالْوُلْدَانِ It means God is blaming Muslims if they don't go to combat in this case. And what is the matter with you? That you do not combat in the way of Allah and for the once deemed weak and oppressed among men, women, and children. Those who are non-combatants suffering from oppression, those are what? They are suffering from terrorism. 
So jihad means war on terrorism. God is telling Muslims, how come you don't fight terrorism? Jihad equals war and terrorism, but the real one, not war for oil, and then call it war on terrorism. So I wish that this uh, person, this uh, uh, man who appeared saying so, would educate himself better about jihad. He has to understand how come the word jihad scares people in the West, but people use it to name their children, even girls. You can find a, a three-year-old girl with rosy cheeks, and, and her name is jihad. She tells you, my name is jihad, Abu. Why would Arab people or Muslim people call their children girls jihad? It's definitely something beautiful, something nice. He has to understand what it means because this gap in understanding it is really um, dangerous. That's it. What's your comments on this? Uh, this is the statement of the last and final message sent to mankind, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Uh, you seeing this up on the, was this, this is way before the G Geneva Conventions, huh? Yes, exactly. And these are actually the uh, commandments of Prophet Muhammad to the, uh, actually of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq to the army of Usama. Usama was a 16-year-old uh, uh, chief uh, uh, of, of an army whom Prophet Muhammad sallam wanted to uh, uh, mobilize him and with his army, and then the Prophet died, so they were mobilized by Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, the first caliph, and he told them exactly these instructions, which are on a poster in the uh, United Nations. It, actually, it is, I think, the, uh, the Red Cross uh, in, in Geneva. You see uh, Adam here on the PBD podcast, he starts off with he sympathizes with the Palestinian people, but they have this term that you just defined, uh, jihad. So what we got here, the facts, jihad does not mean holy war. Yeah. You number two, you you mentioned uh, the the Pope. This actually was coined during the Christian Crusades. People can go look this up. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. What was the Pope's name? What was the Pope's Urban, name? Urban the second. Urban the second. Yes. And then. Okay, so we got this out of the way. Now, if somebody is just like, you know, you you come to someone and you think that um, you think Hanukkah is Christmas, and then someone says, no, they celebrate this uh, Hanukkah. It's Christmas. No, it's not Christmas. It's uh, totally something different, right? Exactly. So exactly. you so now you've defined the clearly clear, clearly what it is. Yeah. Uh, the term is translated. What is it uh, linguistically translated? G, uh, to struggle and strive. Jihad linguist has three main meanings, a linguistic meaning, which is to do an extra effort. Any extra effort is jihad. And there is also a spiritual meaning, which is to strive against oneself, against your ego, against your... So he mentioned, he, met, he, met, he, he mentioned that part. Yeah, so go ahead. Yeah, he mentioned that one. Yeah, so there is also a spiritual meaning. And there is something called uh, um, the biggest jihad, which is... To, to say a word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, the biggest form of jihad is a word of truth in the presence of a tyrant. What do tyrants do? Tyrants kill. Prophet Muhammad is encouraging people to stand against tyrants and say the truth, even if this can lead to their own demise, because we all are going to die one day. But if people are silent when they see uh, uh, corruption, this will lead to more corruption. So a community or a society of silent people is a community or a society of devils. They ha we have to speak. And this, the last tar uh, type of jihad is combative jihad, and there's a code for combative, for combat. It's called the code of combat. Gotcha. Okay, so then, uh, so this this whole idea, could it seem like what he was saying is misinformed there, is that like Muslims have this jihad, this one spiritual part fighting off, you know, the devil and fighting off the nafs, you know, the inner self, the ego and all that stuff, it's good. But then they got this thing there, it's, you know, it's this holy war, and and that's what you got to kind of like, but at least people with this premise this like... contradicts in itself uh -huh. what he just said, that holy war, which is to go and kill people everywhere. No, I'm sorry. How can you be a good person and you struggle against your nafs, against your ego, against your evil inclinations, and you go, go kill people everywhere? It's exactly what Robert mm -hmm. Spencer said. You have killed them wherever you find them. Wherever you find them where? In supermarkets? If he just continues to say the whole 
uh, uh, sign. The whole sign says that until the war is over. So this is in war. And whatever you find them, it's about people whom their country was occupied. God is telling people and is encouraging Muslims not to accept occupation. This is the problem of Muslims, what people don't understand. The, our problem is that we do not believe that God promised anybody the holy land, our land. So are we supposed to just accept when we find people coming from Europe 70, uh, 80 years ago, uh, fleeing the persecution, and we welcome them. Actually, the, the Jews were welcomed by the Palestinians. We're giving them shelter. We're giving them places to live. And they had no problems until they found that, oh, there's an agenda. Here, here started the problem. Are we supposed to accept what other scriptures say? No, I'm sorry. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. Don't tell me that mm -hmm. God promised you 3,000 years ago that my land will be your land. And then you kick me out in the sea. This is completely, this is insane. Uh, one more thing before we get into the alphabet movement and your experiences now working together, actually going to Christian conferences and, yeah. you know, giving, giving, uh, your feedback, your advice, and listening, how we can work together. I, I want you to get your comments on this. This is from um, actually a good friend of mine, Dr. Sabil, because uh, this is the current uh, situation that's going on, and people yeah. think there's some something that Muslims inherently, they hate Jews or whatnot. Uh, I want you to get your reaction to this. We don't hate Jews, actually. When the Prophet Muhammad went to Medina, he uplifted Jews and women. How did he do that? Let me quote you, Paul a Jewish scholar by the name of Dr. David Warrenstein. He wrote, Islam saved the Jewry. Means Islam saved the Jewish people. Right. So the number one reason that he gave is that uh, the Jewish people, they were at the brink of extinction around the birth of Muhammad, peace be upon him. The Persians, the Egyptians, the Romans and others, they were all preying on the Jewish people. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he gave the Jewish uh, groups in Medina autonomy. The second reason that he gave is the Spanish Inquisition. So when the Jewish people, when they, kicked, when they were kicked out, they went to the Muslim land, the Ottoman Empire, and yes, Palestine. So again, Muslims and Islam, they gave them the freedom and the protection in the land to the Jewish people. It's a forgotten history, by the way. You don't hear much about this in the schools nowadays, do you, in the universities? What are your comments on that? Is, there, is this um, something that just made up by Muslims? No, 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 no. This is history. This is history. Well, Jews have always found a safe haven with Muslims in the Muslim world. By the way, the closest to, to the Muslims in Aqidah, in beliefs, are the Jews, actually, not the Christians. The Christian theology is completely different from us. But the Jewish theology is very close to us when it comes to Tawheed and stuff like that, a lot. But So we didn't have a problem, even what we eat. You know, I eat freely when I eat in a Jewish restaurant. I don't care. I don't even ask if it's halal or not. I don't care if it's, if it's kosher, then that's fine. So we don't have a big problem with each other. We have a problem with occupiers. We have a problem with, with oppressors, whether the oppressors are Muslims or Jews or Christians. So is the difference here, the, the, when you um, differentiate Jewish, because there's a lot of, I've interviewed a lot of Jews, uh, Miko Pillet is one of them, I always mention his names because I consider him a friend, he's an uh, Israeli Jew. The Israeli media is playing this shameful role of collaborating with the occupation. The government, the army, the secret services don't want you to tell. And the consumers, the readers and the viewers don't want to hear and don't want to know. And then yeah. someone will ask, what happened here? How come that this society is living in this denial? I try to whistle in the darkness, but I don't think it has any influence. On the contrary, you see that Everything goes to the opposite direction. So what's the point? I remember I asked my father the same question one day. He said, well, I don't want them to be able to say that they didn't know. Yeah. yeah. They cannot say they didn't know. The famous rabbi who lived in Jerusalem, he was one of the uh, anti-Zionist uh, rabbis, li like uh, Rabbi Weiss that you interviewed. And he was interviewed by a student of his. And the student said to him, if, um, uh, if you were in charge today, what would be the first thing that you would do? And this rabbi said, the first thing I would do is I would ask the Palestinians to come back. And the student says, why? What are you talking about? They're terrorists. They want to kill us. And the rabbi, his name is Rabbi Amram, Rabbi Amram Blau. And the rabbi said, 
Who told you that? Who told you that the Arabs were going to kill us? We had great relations with the Muslims and the Arabs back in the day. You know, his family lived in Hebron and his half family lived in Jerusalem that always had, you know, Jewish minorities. He said, we had great relations. We shared the same values. We shared the similar culture. You know, we all treat each other with respect. It was only, only when the Zionists came, the beginning of the 20th century, that the terrorism began, that the violence began. And it was initiated not by the Palestinians, not by the Arabs and the Muslims, but by the Zionists. He wrote the uh, General Saad, you have Rabbi Weiss, Rabbi Shapiro, and others who've come out and they're against the Zionist movement, mm -hmm. this movement now that uh, this is what everything's revolving around here. So Many Jews believe wrongly that Zionism is either part of Judaism or is compatible with Judaism or is even the main part of Judaism. All of those are actually false. Zionism was created to negate Judaism. Zionism was created to replace Judaism. The differences between Zionism and Judaism are vast. They are vast and profound. The propaganda that the Zionists have churned out for the past hundred years have confused and conflated Zionism and Judaism such that when the average person walks down the street, he thinks that the state of Israel is the Jewish state, he thinks that Zionism is Judaism, and he doesn't know the difference. This group of Jews here are students of the students of the late Satmar Rabbi, Rabbi Yoel Teitelbaum, who was the greatest disseminator of the clarity regarding the difference between Judaism and Zionism. So. Yeah, the, actually, actually, on, actually, Rabbi uh, Weiss, I actually uh, interviewed Rabbi you met, Weiss. You met, I, I, oh, way, you met him. You met the rabbi. We met, we, we go to Muslim countries now because we are, uh, it's a requirement, as the chief rabbi of Palestine, Rabbi Teitelbaum, said, we are required to let the world know that these Zionists and their state does not speak for the Jewish people and they are not um, um, in any way have the right to use Judaism to oppress, to steal the land from the Palestinian people. Uh, these people who are good to us, and we babysat each other's children, we live together, they have no right to steal from them. The Torah doesn't permit you to steal. The Zionist wants to confuse to make it that there's a religious conflict. Nothing to do with religion. The, on the contrary, the Muslims and the Arab people were for us, our friends and our patrons, the ones who protect us and provide a safe haven. And they should not be full, full, full victim of this evil movement of Zionism. With God's help, if you remove this impediment to peace, Zionism, a new, a relatively new ideology, so a hundred mere years, then the Jews and Muslims and uh, Christians were living for hundreds and hundreds of years, and it was never a problem. Ah, I interviewed him. I had a show called The Islamic Show on Channel 30 in the Washington, D.C. area 25 years ago, when I was the Muslim chaplain of the American University there. So I, I interviewed him. He's a friend. Mm -hmm. And those people are yeah. fair. What advice would you, would you give just for the average uh, person? I've also had um, a Christian lady on. Uh, she represents the uh, organization called If Americans Knew. You know, not to mention the, the three billion dollars a year, eight billion just spent. You know, yeah. uh, to 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 send when you have people here on the streets, you have people here. You know, overrun with poverty. Some places look like they've been um, taken back to uh, they, they, you know, the stone. I mean, they they've been really in, uh, inflected by war. Some places here in the U.S. and mm -hmm. people here need that money. And she makes this a point. Also, uh, other things. You know, she was somebody who was also in an ardent supporter on one end and then she really you know opened her eyes and she got past the programming that was happening so wh what do you say to people you know if they want it because they they're just being programmed usually what they see on tv the media and whatnot and they have an agenda so what would you tell for people to get a better understanding of what's going on because i think anybody who, who looks into and sees you know open air prism deprive the basic human necessities ba you know the people who are living in conditions worse than animals you know people yeah. Uh, with any kind of God consciousness, uh, uh, awakening a heart, you know, they, they would uh, stand up, you know, a modern day apartheid. What would you say? How would they I get would, What's the best way to get informed? Well, the best way to get informed is, well, you, listen, when you want to know how a certain uh, dish tastes, you have to ask someone who tasted that dish. You can't go and ask people uh, who never uh, 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 saw that dish or tasted that dish. You have to go to Muslims. Go to any mosque near you and, and enter the mosque and ask Muslims, and you will see how they welcome you, how they tell you the truth. 
I don't shy from telling people that, yes, there is combative jihad. I didn't say that jihad is only jihad in nafs against one's ego. No. No, why? Uh, by the way, Islam is beautiful already. It doesn't need any plastic surgeries or makeup. I'm not going to beautify Islam. It is beautiful already. And one of the most beautiful things about Islam is that it is based on evidence. Islam, I, I never, well, Islam is a religion of justice. And justice should be established through peaceful means. But if Muslims fail to establish justice through peaceful means, unfortunately, they have to resort to war. Guys, this is common sense. I'm not saying something strange here. So I wish that every American go to the nearest mosque and ask people about Islam. Ask us about Islam. Don't ask people about us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one verse I always think about, chapter 60, verse 8. It's so beautiful. It just trumps all of this, uh, what a lot of Islamophobes put out, where God Almighty Allah is saying in the Quran that God does not forbid you from dealing kindly and justly yeah. with those who have not fought you because your religion or driven you out of your homes. This is exactly. such a powerful, beautiful, yes, beautiful exactly. verse. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell me now, so you got to see this PD, PBD podcast with Patrick and David, and you wanted to um, give some insights, personal insights, uh, that you, because you've been dealing with this a lot now. Can you actually, go ahead and share some of your experiences? Yeah. Yeah, well, actually, well, uh, uh, you, which, which, you mean the one that had a debate? Yes, the one that had the debate and yeah. his bigger vision of, of Muslims and Christians and others working together because you have the sexualization yes. of the children yes. and you've had many cases now that this is being pushed, pushed down the throats of um, I, of yes. Muslims and it's a deliberate attack and you've actually gone, gone even deeper and you've gone to yes. some of these conventions and you've actually had uh, some success also in this area, helping people who... Yeah. yeah, just go ahead and share. It's coming from you. Okay, okay, let me tell you what. Well, I, I've been involved in this uh, issue of the alphabet movement and seeing what they are doing and how they infiltrated some of our uh, uh, children, actually, by making them sympathize with them by uh, throwing on them false information and misconceptions that we can actually mention now. But the issue is the only two factions that are standing strongly against this um, uh, destructive ideology are the Christian right wing and the Muslims. Christians right wing have a big problem with Muslims. I went several times to their conferences. I spoke to them and I told them, listen, guys, I'm not telling you that we love you. I'm not asking you to love us. But for the sake of our children, you need us and we need you. So we need to make a bridge. Let's make peace now, truce now, and let's forget about that. You know, I, you know in one of these conferences, I'm there and someone, one of the, the head of a big organization, she's texting me that Jesus is the son of God and you have to accept that before we work. What's that? You understand me? I'm not going to accept that. And, and I can't debate with her on that. I studied Christianity like I studied Islam also. But I'm not there for that. Guys, let's put these things aside now and see how can we do things together. You see, when Muslims mobilized... Uh, 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 in Canada? Protests in Canada, about a million people went out in many cities. Wow. It was... Was a success so how what if we join hands together and do something together because we are now on the defensive when someone is on the defensive he's never going to win a war you have to also start uh things like for example go uh, making surveys about the countries uh, that banned the therapy of same-sex attraction we have mm. to see what happened since they banned it how many people became suicidal because of the ban of same-sex attraction? Because they told us that uh, they banned it. They banned it because uh, it's a failure and it makes people suicidal. Actually, I have a case of a boy who is becoming suicidal because he cannot find a therapist. So that's the problem. Um, uh, we, we, there's a lot of things that we can do together. 
that is a straight yeah this crime. is important this is a, this is a great story uh can you share that this so you had this um this person who came to you and he wants to start a family he want he has these uh, urges he has these desires yeah. and then what happened he wants to suppress these desires because yeah. god almighty has yeah. given a certain yeah. avenue of how you can express these desires and that's through marriage that's through yeah. man and woman coming yeah. together but he was going in the opposite direction so now he wanted uh, if i'm correct he wanted his mother to help him to go and get him this a kind therapist. of uh, therapy yeah therapist yeah but then what happened from there? I'll tell you. Well, actually, uh, uh, this boy reached puberty last year. And he told his mom, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I had a wet dream. The bad news is I have a crush on my male friends. But don't worry, mom. Mm -hmm. I went to the internet. Uh, she, uh, he was always raised by her, a single mom. And I went to the internet mm -hmm. and I found that there is a therapy. And the therapy is uh, about 50% success rate. And uh, it is, it's going to be okay. She said, no, listen, they are about to ban the therapy. So I don't have a problem that you go and live the gay life. He told her, no, don't say that. It's my dream to marry a woman like you and have a child and a girl and name her after you, mom. She said, listen, I don't need any hassle. I don't need problems. They are criminalizing the therapy. Please, I don't care. Go live the gay life. He said, listen, if you don't find me a therapist, I will take my life. So it looks like banning the therapy is also making people suicidal. And because they told us it's, uh, it's their uh, uh, therapy fails. Actually, therapy doesn't fail in every case. No, they bring you cases where, with whom the therapy has failed. Well, which therapy works 100 percent the the question is does it work with some people not it, it doesn't work with some people every therapy well cancer therapy works with 20 percent who dares to 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 ban cancer therapy uh, so actually i want to tell you this because you know what i'm going to tell you even a, a, a more interesting story that happened to one of my friends one of my friends who raised his children in an islamic school and when they went to universities, he felt that they are changing, they are, they are becoming more westernized, speaking things like uh, sympathizing with uh, the alphabet movement and stuff like that. So he was really worried. And his wife told him, listen, they don't necessarily mean what they say. Sometimes children just test our limits. So he wanted to see if they really mean it or not. So he called his children, uh, his daughter was actually married. He told her, I want you to come on Tuesday at six, leave your husband at home. Don't bring him with you. Okay. He called the other two kids. They were both in university. He told them, come on Tuesday at six, the three of you. I want you. There's an important information to tell you. He is separated from their, uh, from their mother, actually. So they expected that he is going to tell them that he's going to get married or something like that. They expected that. So they went, mm, his daughter is making tea. Uh, Dad, huh, what did you want to say? Because I want to go home. He said, no, come here and sit. They sat. He said, listen, I want to tell you this. I've been having same-sex attraction since a long time. And I haven't came out until today. Now I am coming out to you. Your father is gay. And he is going to get married. And the children fell one of them fell and the other one started to cry and his daughter told him this is not a joke he said why are you reacting like that i never expected this homophobic reaction from you you always sounded open-minded and they broke up and they told him no way so he told them listen i was i um it, it's not true i was just testing to see if you really changed your principles and your values or not but that was mind-blowing what he did. When he told me this, I found it mind-blowing, actually. Anyway, the issue mm -hmm. is, I studied the issue, and I found that there are six main misconceptions that they use to infiltrate our youth, our children. Mainly, number one, that Muslims misunderstood the story of Qawm Lut, and that homosexuality is not haram. The problem of Qawm Lut is that they were bandits, cutting off roads, attacking travelers, uh, traveling in caravans, and raping them. The second problem is, or the second misconception is that the Quran has a mistake. 
archaeologists proved that there was homosexuality among the pharaohs. And Prophet Lut said in Surah Al-A'raf, I think Surah Al-A'raf, وَلُوطًا إِذْ قَالَ لِقَوْمِهِ أَتَأْتُونَ الْفَاحِشَةَ مَا سَبَقَكُمْ بِهَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنَ الْعَالَمِينَ A lot when he said to his people, do you commit such obscenity with which no one in all communities has preceded you? How come he says so when the pharaohs had it? The third misconception, they say, it's not about sex, it's about love. What if I wake up one day falling in love with one of my male colleagues? And this is, in my opinion, the most dangerous one because it depends on emotional influence. Who can control his heart? Huh? The fourth misconception is that it is not against fitra, it's not against, against innate nature because it exists among animals. And so this means that it's natural. Five, therapy of same-sex attraction is a failure and it doesn't work and it makes people suicidal. And it is immoral because torture is involved in it. That's what they say, which is completely false and I can prove it. Sixth and the last misconception is this community deserves a special treatment because they are oppressed and persecuted in many countries. And this is also a false statement. So this number one, we need to answer all these six misconceptions for our children so that they don't, be, don't get fooled by anyone else. Uh, uh, and also we need to understand what can we tell our children in order to protect them from these ideologies. And there is um, a, a discourse or a, a rhetoric for children under 11 years and for children over 11 years that can increase their level of uh, critical thinking. And also what can a parent do if his child came back and told him that he is transgender or she is transgender? What can you do? And, uh, or, or maybe identifies himself as a dog or a cat. So we need to know that. Also, our children are asked by Islamophobes, do Muslims hate LGBT? How can you answer this, a proper answer? So this is very, how to answer Muslims themselves who ask, are we at the end of time because of, of the spread of these ideologies? Because many Muslims today are very desperate and they say, we must be at the end of time. Well, people said so at the time of the Crusades when they established for 90 years a, a kingdom called the Kingdom of Jerusalem, crusades in, in the middle of the Muslim world. People said, this must be the end of time. And it wasn't the end of time. Just a good, respectable generation appeared and pushed them out. And also after 150 years from that day, uh, uh, the Mongols invaded the Muslim world and they slayed over 1 million Muslims in Iraq they killed and they slaughtered the Khalifa, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Khalifa, the Abbasi Khalif, Khalif. And Muslims at that, said, at that time, many of them said, this must be the end of time. Yawm al-Qiyamah must be tomorrow. And it wasn't the end of time. Just a good uh, uh, and respectable generation appeared and pushed it out. The issue is, today we are being infiltrated uh, by such ideologies, the spread of atheism, the spread of these uh, uh, sexual uh, um, uh, uh, misconduct and stuff. The issue is, we may, we may be at the end of time and maybe not. At every era, there is such things that happen, fitna that happens. We can be the chosen ones that Allah chose to face such ideologies. And Muslims have to understand that. Islam cannot just protect itself against these ideologies. No, Islam can defeat them. Islam is strong enough to defeat them. We just need to do one thing. Stop whining and start working. Because we're all the time whining and complaining and no one is doing it. No, we need to start working, planning and working. That's, that's what I believe. Last thing before we conclude. So now what I'm getting here is that uh, these, these, um, this experience now with the Christians, was it at the end of the day, uh, do you think this, this is something that together is going to have a much stronger impact? 
And when they see that, you know, we're not the enemy, I mean, you know, yeah. you have others who are others that they sit and they, they defend and whatnot. And the, some of the others, we don't mention their names, they can look into it, uh, who actually curse Jesus, who actually curse his mother and whatnot. I mean, I, I just can't wrap my mind around this. I mean, we're people who, at the end of the day, we call upon Jesus, what he called himself, a messenger of God. And the Bible is called, he was a servant, a messenger of God. And we confirm that, you know, we, we uh, a Muslim can end up in the hellfire saying one disrespectful thing about Jesus, peace be upon him. Many Christians have woken up to this fact. They don't, yeah. I don't think they really yeah. know this. That's why I think it's so important that they know that. How can you be the enemy when you love and revere Jesus? How? How? You don't, you don't say any disrespectful thing about him. We How? need someone to build the bridge between us and them. Believe me, I always had uh, uh, hopes in Jordan Peterson, but uh, uh, that he failed. When Palestine is free, people like him are going to be ashamed that they did this. Now I really have hopes in uh, Patrick. Uh, uh, Patrick. But yes, I mm -hmm. think he can build the bridges between us. Let's not say that we need to love each other now because it looks like the gap is very big. At least let's cooperate in what is common. We have common values, family values. Let's cooperate together to save our children and postpone for now the childish things. These, these differences will never end. There will always be people who believe in Jesus as Lord. And there will always be people who don't believe in Jesus except as a messenger and a prophet and love him as well. So let's leave mm -hmm. these things aside now and we really have to work quickly. I want to tell you something. We have a big problem that is going to um, uh, explode in our faces very soon, which is the rainbow. People, religious people from the Christian side and from the Muslim side tell their five and <coughs> six-year-old kids that, no, they cannot buy them uh, a bag with a rainbow on it or, or a T-shirt with a rainbow on it because it's haram. It, God hates this. But this means that you are creating a complex in the child by telling him that God hates beauty because it's the most beautiful combination of colors. So we need to work together to redeem the rainbow. The rainbow has to be diluted. It should not mean anything. Not the their movement nor anything, but how to do so? We need to cooperate, and we cannot do that as long as they are distancing themselves from us like that. Let's see if Patrick. Do you think Patrick? I wish he can do this. Patrick Ben David, huh? He can replace the. Uh, you think the uh, Jordan Peterson? Yeah. It seems like many see that he pretty much uh, he sold himself uh because he had one way of thinking and then he jumped over to this certain uh i think it was daily wire yeah he got a big paycheck and now his whole his whole direction changed unfortunately, uh, unfortunately yeah all right thank you very much hey god thank almighty you. the creator of allah bless you and if people want to uh see some of your documentaries uh there are many not yet muslims out there not watching and they want to learn more about islam where can they see these documentaries on our, that web, you have on about... our channel actually this is not a gas station that i work for this is my organization bridges foundation so if you go to youtube type bridges foundation channel it will appear to you an ugly person will appear to you who is myself and subscribe and there's a lot of playlists. One of them is called The Fog is Lifting Playlist. It has the three documentaries we made. Uh, part one is called Islam in Brief. And part two is called Jihad on Terrorism. Ten people appear speaking on this, uh, in this documentary. Five of them are non-Muslims. Two of them are Jews. And all of them are defending combative jihad scholarly. And there is Islam in women, which is so you got you got you you got you got you got Jews in there also on this documentary who are defending jihad. Yes, of course. Yeah, wow. yeah, of course, of course. I have a lot of Jewish friends, by the way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this dispels much of those myths already. We've I don't think someone can watch this and still have uh, hopefully that. Uh, by the false way, one of, them, one of them is a very interesting person called Dr. Philippe Sands. He is the international mm -hmm. law professor in UCL in London. And he, you know what, he volunteered to defend 10 Guantanamo uh, prisoners. Wow. <laughs> Jewish he, attorney. He's a Jew. I, I, I'll tell you more than that. Yeah. Well, in his house, we're filming with him. And he said, 
If people are saying that uh, this is terrorism, they have to go and, and see the Jewish organizations who are blowing buses and hotels in Palestine, which is now called Israel. So I said, cut, cut. Listen, beautiful. But can you please repeat that? But instead of saying Jewish organizations, say Zionist organizations, he said, get out all of you. You cowards, they are attacking Islam. I didn't say anything wrong. By the way, go tell them that I'm a Jew. I said, what? He said, yes. What's I'm his name? What's his, what, Dr. what's Philippe his Sands. name? Philippe Sands. He's amazing. Is he a self-hating Jew? Uh, definitely. You know what? They call self-hating Jews. I'm, I'm sorry for the word, but it's called the shit list. S-H-I-T. Self-hating and Israel threatening. And I think hmm. we need the same self-hating and Islam threatening. And we should have our list of people because you know what? These days, a lot of those appear and they surfaced on Twitter attacking the oppressed and saying, we stand with Israel. And they're supposed to be Muslim. We need this SHIT list. May um may the good people come together who are really striving toward justice and peace. Yeah. And hopefully people can benefit from this program we just did. We'll see you in the future, inshallah. God willing. Thank you very much. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you very much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Peace alaykum. be with you. I'm sure all of you know Eddie from the Dean Show. And I'm sure that we've all heard about the Dean Center. Now you don't want to miss on this opportunity. The brother has been around for a long time. When I became Muslim, that was a show that I used to watch. It was one of the shows that I actually was interviewed on. And since then, I've kept in touch with Eddie and we've cooperated and participated in many things together, alhamdulillah, by the blessings of Allah. And now you guys have to do your part. This is for the ummah. There's so many people in this world who need the message of Islam. But the question is now, what you're gonna do? What are you going to do with your money, with what you have? What are you going to do to help the ummah, to help someone who's been around for 20 years? doing da'wah you've enjoyed the shows you've enjoyed the interviews you've enjoyed now it's your turn support the dean center I cannot leave without giving you a gift if you're not yet muslim and you tune in to see what these muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the quran go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com we'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you and if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.